almost threw my phone across the room. <laughs> I told a lot of people about him when I was there earlier. I said he's gonna he got a chance to be special. I seen him up close and personal. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Point Game presented by DraftKings. Don't forget, DraftKings is your home for all the action across the NBA and gets you closer to the game we all love. The crown is yours. I'm one of your hosts, CJ Toledano, and as always, I'm joined by the reason why we have this show, five-time NBA All-Star, number one overall pick in the 2010 NBA Draft, ladies and gentlemen, John Wall. John, how you feeling, man? What's good, man? I'm, uh, I'm feeling great. Great, 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 great. <laughs> Happy to be back for another episode. Um, just to talk, man, just to sit back and get these guys what we want to give them. So I'm um, super excited. We, uh, we're we in a good time of basketball right now because we got March Madness coming up. Playoffs are, are almost here. So uh, I know we talk about Kentucky alum in this pod. In this past weekend was Selection Sunday. How are you feeling about your Wildcats, Kentucky, getting that three seed? Uh, I'm, I'm super excited. I feel like uh, I wanted them to win the SEC tournament, you know what I mean? But yeah. uh, they fell short of that. But uh, – it's tough to win nine games, you know what I mean? Because if you go your whole tournament, win that, then you got to go to the NCAA tournament. So um, I think they just gave them a – they wanted to win for sure. I wanted them to. I think just giving them a break, uh, get some guys healthy, uh, get their mindset ready for the NCAA tournament. and uh, Just know this, you lose one game, you go home. And uh, I hope those guys make a, a heck of a run because I have them going far. And uh, – I hope they can do something special. I want to go back to the NBA because we had a, a, a bunch of fun games and moments that happened since we last talked. Now, we you have talked – actually, in our last episode, you talked about two of these guys who I'm going to bring up. Uh, the first one, I'm just going to ask you, did you see that Anthony Edwards dunk last night against the Jazz? For sure I did. I almost threw my phone across <laughs> the room. Uh, and I think that what was spectacular about it is – he dunked the basketball so hard, the ball hit his finger and dislocated it. And they, you had to sit back and watch because, like, in that moment, he looked at him, but then he looked at his finger, and he didn't really, like, give that, like, how he wanted to celebrate. So he walked to the back. Everybody like, what happened? Hope he didn't, like, break his finger right. or anything. But um, I don't think I ever seen somebody get dunked on and get a concussion. <laughs> that's what – that there were like, so that's many – that's the point that <laughs> – that's the point that got me like, what? Like, you got dunked on. You know, John Collins shot at him because he used to one dunking on yeah. a lot of people. And – um. To get dunked them like that, but then, like, have to walk to the back and can't play no more, like, it's like, damn. I would be mad about that. Because I, I seen him walking to the bench and, like, somebody was, like, holding him, like, like touching his back, trying to talk to him. He moved their hand, like, you know, kind of probably right, mad. Right. And then probably, like, man, I can't finish the game. But, uh, yeah, and, and special, man. We had a, we talked about this on the other, one of our other episodes. Like, I told everybody, he's he's special the way he works out, the way he determined himself to be great, the leadership he has brought to his team. No, it's spectacular, man. That was like – that's dunk of the year for sure. I don't know if anybody can uh, top that one. Well, it, it actually brought up – we were trying to think of, like, best dunks of all time, and we are bringing up Blake, Blake Griffin, who had – you know, and I want to ask you this. Do you still classify it a dunk, or is it a little bit in the shady area where, like, throwing in the dunk? Like, you're above the rim, and you're – it's not technically you, like, grab the rim, but you throw well, it I in. Think, I think the part that you have to understand and respect more than, like, the dunk – like, grabbing the rim is something – but to be that high, and I can just throw the ball in and still make it, like, <laughs> yeah. that lets you know how high I am. And uh, you got Blake that has some dunks. I remember, like I said before, I had uh, fr- uh, uh, Liz Frank injuring my foot against yeah. the Bulls. And then I can just go to, like, you know, you go to the internet real quick. I'm like, man, this is the game. Blake played in New York in uh, L.A. He spin move dunk, baseline dunk. I'm like, damn, like, uh, rookie of the year is gone. <laughs> like, the way he started doing that game. But, uh. He even got DeAndre Jordan, you know what I mean? Like, when he caught the alley on Brandon Knight. So, it's so many spectacular dunks that's been going on. But, yeah, man, that was special. Off the top of your head, do you have, like, three – like, what are your top three dunks of all time? I got to go Vince Carter on Alonzo Mourning. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say Olympics. Oh, you just say any time? Like, you don't have to be NBA? I think all time. Yeah, NBA. Not an NBA. Oh, well, Olympics is one for me. Olympics yeah, is one to jump over say. a seven-footer is one. Gerald Green alley windmill in yeah. Jersey is spectacular. Underrated dunker, one of the best 
dunkers of all time. Gerald oh, Green. for sure. I was in I was in Houston with him, and he was old, and he still was like no <laughs> socks, no shoes on, in socks, windmill, twin legs, all vert. That's crazy. that was spectacular. Yeah. Um, another guy I wanted to talk about, and we've talked about on the show a bunch, Kyrie. So last Sunday. Kyrie had that left-handed skyhook, I think, skyhook game winner. And I think – here's why I want to bring him up because I feel like we're not showing enough love. I mean, I know me and you are, but, like, people seem to have forgotten about Kyrie because he's been on a couple different teams. And, like, they're forgetting that he is him. Right now he's averaging 26 points um, a game. So, like, can you, one, describe what makes Kyrie Kyrie, why he's special, and maybe even go into, you know, your relationship with him and those battles that, that were so special that everyone remembers? I think makes Kyrie special because nobody else can do what he do. Yeah. He's the best layup finisher we've seen in the game, either hand. Um, can catch and shoot, can jab, shoot, off the dribble, shoot, mid-range, can post up, floaters either hand. Um He's just special, man. Like I said, I think he's the most skilled player that I have seen play the game of basketball. You know what I mean? I wasn't around older days, but I've watched a lot of highlight, watched a lot of YouTube. There's nothing that man can't do on the basketball floor. And he's doing it at 6'2". You know what I mean? And then I think he showed us in what Brooklyn, he can, he can catch an alley and dunk that people think he can't. He barely uses it. But um, our battle's always been amazing. I think just us competing at a high level, you know what I mean? Him being younger than me, but one of the best guards in the league. Um, I'm competing at him, so, like, he's going to bring the best out of you. Um, just battling, going at it day to day. Uh, I remember we was at home in D.C., and he had a reverse. You know what I mean? I'm used to timing up blocks, and I took over the whole left side of the backboard. I'm like, there's no way he can reverse and spin it on the other side of the glass. And he did it. I'm like, man, damn. You know what I mean? So, like, some things he just – just, like, how how is he able to do it? And uh, I think a lot of people appreciate what Kyrie's done when he's done. But him now, you could just say he's happy. Like, he ain't dealing with no other stuff. He just focused and locked in on playing basketball. Um, he has his family. He has his kids. He's enjoying that. And uh, you could just see it's a joy in his face. Like, he's just like, man, I'm out here to play basketball. You know what I mean? And he's enjoying it. He's, he's, just, he's a very special talent. Um, like I said before, like, when our mom passed or just dealing with injuries, he's the guy that contact me, make sure I'm good. Um, even when we played the year I was coming back from my Achilles in L.A. at uh, – the Skills Academy, we competed, you know what I mean, just competing at a high level and just trying to make each other better. That's one thing we always did. And uh, one thing I do wish we could happen, it would have been special, I think, for the league is uh, me and him to match up in a whole playoff series. Uh, we always fell short of that, but I wish uh, we would have had the opportunity so the league can see that in my prime and him in his prime. There was a, there was like a famous mic'd up where you were you were asking, like, how come I haven't gotten oh, my Christmas Kyrie's? Day. Did you ever get yeah. your pair? No, 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 no. I was joking. <laughs> I was joking with him, but like... Like that's like like we always competed. Cause I remember I had uh, split the screen and tried to dunk and I missed, and, we, and I was dribbling up the court like a play later or two. And he was like, "Yeah, you missed your highlight." <laughs> and I'm like, "Man, I don't care about missing no highlight." And then um, I, I was wearing Paul George's at the time, and I was like, "Damn, bro, like I can't get no Kyrie's. Like, what's going on?" Just joking with him, but you know, people take it and run with it. Right, right. Um, but I respect every point guard that has a shoe, but I just can never wear another point guard shoe when I'm competing against him. You know what I mean? Or even throughout that year. You know what I mean? I'm glad for all the point guards that do have their shoe. I just can never wear it when I'm playing against him or throughout my, uh, my career. But uh, he's he's a hell of a talent. He had great shoes. He's he's a he's, he's special, man. He's special. Yeah, we'll see what the. I think he's really gonna help the Mavs uh, this postseason. I think I think he will, and I think um, just him and Luca like having a full year to try to figure each other out when he, how to balance the attacks to play with each other uh, on the floor and figure it out. And I think adding guys like PJ Washington and um, Daniel Gafford really helped them get some more depth. Yeah, on their uh, offensive team. Can I can I clear something else up with the OGs? Because you know how the the social media works is they they yeah. run with quotes. So the, and and I'm in social too, so I know how to get headlines. The thing that I saw people in the last couple of days, they were quote and saying like you you said that the NBA people don't play defense anymore, and that's the only yeah. thing they ran, just that text. Well, and then, then yeah, people are I like know. John Wall doesn't play defense, and I'm like you guys don't know the stats, so I'll let you just you know let's use our platform well, here to I, like for that. me I know I played defense bro like I was in the area where you had to really guard some of the best guards it wasn't no somebody else guarding them I was guarding the best of the best guards uh I feel like I should have been on more all defensive teams mm -hmm. I led the league in steals a couple of years uh I probably have the most blocks I think I have the Number most two. blocks as a point guard of all time yeah. as point guards but as guards under six four or six three I think is D Wade and me yeah um I feel like if I didn't have the injuries, I could have had a chance to catch him. I mean, I was great at blocking shots. Um, 
But it's like, I'm not saying nobody don't play defense. Yeah. You have guys that still compete at a high level. I'm just saying those guys that's locked down defenders, if I know he's guarding me, I'm going to run a pick and roll and get him switched off for me to get a weaker defender on me. That's basically what I mean. And it turns into one-on-one -on -one basketball trying to ISO. So uh, I seen somebody say, like, well, Herb Jones played defense. I'm like, I know Herb Jones played defense. He <laughs> takes the challenge. Yeah. I know guys like Kawhi Leonard played defense. I see Anthony Edwards play defense. I know – um who else you want? Like a Jerry Vanderbilt, those type of times. Andrew Wiggins, those guys, Jerry Mike Green, they do play defense, but they can't guard everybody. Yeah. And before, you used to have a team that can guard, and if you had a weak defender, you have help. But uh, now it's just, like I said, basically pick up basketball. You know what I mean? You get ISOs. Like, you tell me how many teams got a playbook and tell me how many plays they got in the playbook. I would love to know that nowadays. Yeah. When I first came in, rest in peace, Flip Saunders, I had a playbook with so many plays, it's like, whoa, I remember all these, <laughs> you know what I mean? But luckily for me, I knew – we we had a kind of playbook kind of like from Minnesota when you ran the, most of the plays was for the four men and two men because back then they had Kevin Garnett, the Trustee World, or Wally Zerbiak. You know what I mean? Then sometimes you have a side pick and roll that had Sam Cassell and Marbury and those guys. So I knew what our playbook was and most of our plays was going to. But I don't think teams really have a full playbook like that now. You know what I mean? You have certain counters and certain sets you go to to get guys the ball, but it always turns into an ISO for real. I mean, well, well said there. I, I advise people who are watching this show and going, you know, people, a lot of these shows, they're, they're doing it for not, they're not doing it for clicks, but other accounts will aggregate the controversial line. And again, I've been, I've been guilty of this. I've worked for other sites yeah. or whatever. So uh, what, go back and watch the whole clip. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think every, I think everybody is to a extent, you know what I mean? Cause like, we all say stuff in interviews. We always have conversations that we want to have. And then sometimes they just take that one piece they right. want to hear and make it the main target. But if you don't go back and listen to an interview or listen to what somebody fully said, you would kind of misread somebody. It's like kind of sending somebody a text message and not like them understanding and communicating because they can misread it the wrong way until they hear you talk in person or really get the full uh, description of it. So I know people are going to do what they do with it. It don't bother me. I laugh at it. Yeah. I just commented on somebody. Um, somebody had said something to me on Instagram. And I usually don't never comment <laughs> yeah. or, or respond. And... Uh, he was like, yeah, you you talking about guys don't play defense. Uh, you just mad you're not in the league. And I said, he said, well, you only level, averaged 11 points last year with the Clippers. I said, yeah, that was my job. My job wasn't to be a scorer. Yeah. My job was to run the team. I uh, only played 20 minutes. So 11 points in 20 minutes and seven assists is fine for me. I think that's great. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm like, my job wasn't to be a scorer. My job was to get my teammates involved, run the team. Yeah, That was my job. So I did what my team asked me to do. So it's a big difference. Then he came back and was like, oh, no, I don't mean no harm. Like, I'm one of your biggest fans, and I'm like, uh, okay. We we've seen it. We were talking about it on other shows where where fans yeah. will will heckle, and then you go up to them, and they forget you're you're a real human being. You, you yeah, I'm see. still them. I'm just have opportunity to play it in the league. Yeah. All right. Um, we're gonna take a break. We're gonna have Danny Green joining us next here on Point Game, presented by DraftKings. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano, presented by DraftKings. Uh, we are excited to bring on our next guest here, three-time NBA championship with the Spurs, Lakers, Raptors, 2009 NCAA tournament champion for uh, with UNC. Well, I know we're going to get into that because John's from Kentucky. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Danny Green. Danny, how you feeling, man? I'm good. I'm good, man. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. It was a hell of an introduction. I had to get off. Uh, so I'm a Lakers fan, so I'm going to yeah. talk about that a little bit. Okay. Uh, so appreciate you for that title. But, uh, Danny, um, we, we've seen you on the court this year. And we've also seen you, you know, doing some broadcasts and some media stuff. So I just want to get our listeners and viewers caught up. What have you been up to since, you know, hitting the court with the Sixers earlier this season? At exactly that. I actually just left Yahoo Studios. I'm doing the bracket and the tournament with them. So just talking some of the game, we'll be watching the game in studio live, mostly getting some live reaction stuff, and then we'll be talking and breaking down the game. It's been a while since I've actually been honed in on college basketball. I watch it here and there. Uh, once you're in the pros, you kind of just focus on and not only doing homework for media stuff, but for your scout. So I just usually watching professional games, NBA games, because I'm got to keep the date if I want to play. If I'm going to play against, I need to know who was who. Um, so it's been it's a little different now. Uh, but I feel like colleges, this time of year, it's always fun. Everybody's, you know, ready to, to see if they can win some money. Everybody's ready to see <laughs> if their school can represent them the right way. You know what I'm saying? So that's a fun time. Yeah. How did how did it feel winning the championship in 2009, like the NCAA championship? Because, you know, like, 
That's what it's all for. Like, if you're there for one year, two year, three year, four year, you just want to win one. You know what I mean? Because that's something you get to hold for a long time. I'm very lucky, bro. Especially to be in my last college game because I was a senior. So to be able to win my last college game, surreal moment. You know, as a kid, you dream of this when, when you're in your driveway, working out wherever it is. Um, but yeah, to be able to win a championship in college is what you go to those schools for. That's why you went to Kentucky. And y'all had a chance. Y'all had a really good team. Yeah, have a really good team this year. So you guys might be able to do it. It's, you know, if Carolina don't do not do it, I see Kentucky being one of the teams. I don't want to see UConn going back yeah. to back. So you want to see a, a new winner. Um, but, yeah, man, so winning the national title, being able to play with some of those guys, being on that stage, um, being at my senior year, going to the tournament every year, and being able to chance to experience it. Not everybody gets that. So I'm truly blessed, man, to be a part of some great groups, not just in the NBA but in, in college too. So I've said I'm – extremely blessed to be in the positions i've been in danny we we talk about <clears throat> a lot on this show like the the ups and downs the highs and lows of the career and you talked about you know playing in mm-hmm. a tournament playing for unc obviously you guys are top but then you know you get into the nba and i think a lot of people know about you you know you won these championships in the nba but like you had an interesting start you were waived by the Cavs mm-hmm. after 20 games and a lot, a lot of times the story ends there for a lot of players. But you went G League overseas, and then you had a breakout season with the Spurs. And I think we all, you know, a lot of the community found out about you from that finals. But can you talk a little bit about, like, sort of what you were going through early on in your career and, and like, sort of that unlocker discovery that led to, you know, the career that we all know? Yeah, when you're a kid, it's tough to understand, um, you know, and actually handle some of the tough parts of life. When you're an adult, you've seen so many ups and downs. You've gone through so many different things. That's just part of what builds you as a man and, and your character. And it never ends, never stops. Whether you're a kid, whether you're an adult, there's always, no matter how successful you are, there's always going to be ups and downs. There's always going to be pitfalls. There's always going to be you know, parts where you're going to lose confidence or second guess yourself, even as an adult. You know, and you're going to be like, you know, I know I can do this, but I'm not getting this. You know, I'm not getting attention. I'm not getting, you know, what I deserve. And, that's a big part of life. You know, there's, there's going to be some unfair treatment. There's going to be uh, some hiccups. There's going to be some times where you do everything right and you still don't get what you're supposed to, you know, deserve. Um, and understand as an adult now, it's easier for me to handle it and figure out other avenues. As a kid, all I knew was I got to get in the gym. You know, I got to get better. I got to I gotta find, you know, find a way to, to make it happen. Um, and this is probably one of the first times in my life where I've re- truly, like, busted my ass to get somewhere and not see the – reward for it, not right away but like pretty soon so it's like i'm still waiting you're still waiting on a call you're still waiting on this um but yeah as a youngin you know it's not only just on the court i didn't so i didn't start to my senior year so lucky enough i got to win a championship but i was playing good my minutes my freshman year and then we had a whole good recruiting class come in and i'm on the bench barely playing and seeing if i want to transfer or not back then you can't just transfer and keep playing you got to sit out a year do all this other extra stuff aim pain so <laughs> going from that and having family issues back home you know somebody Pops getting locked up, certain things, brothers going through it. There's a lot of different things up and down. Um, so, yeah, early on, even getting drafted, like people think you make it and you got a lot of money. Back then, I don't know if you know, but I was a second round pick and the money was nowhere near what it is today. You know, as a second round pick before taxes, like 484. It's like $400,000. And after that, you may, you may take home $200,000. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people think you're making millionaires. So, yeah, you still have to pay the debts, whether it's college or family, whatever it is. Um, and figure out your way and figure out if you're going to be in a rotation. I had to play during a lockout when overseas. Um, so but luckily I had a good foundation around me. I had a good supporting cast with not only my Carolina family, but my, my, my real family, you know, my father, my brothers, they were all there. Um, and we all had said, different stories, ups and downs and testaments of life. Luckily mine wasn't as crazy as some other people's are going through it uh, in different ways. Um, so during that time, I said basketball was my outlet. My family was my outlet. And even now the same. You know, I use other now. I have other outlets. I can have podcasts now. We can talk about it. I can go to media stuff. I can do different things. I can talk to my friends. Some people go to therapy. I've done therapy. It helps you vent and get different perspective on it, um, which is a big thing now. Before back in the past, people were looking at therapy like oh, I don't, you know, look at it as a different different viewpoint. Um, but I think it's healthy. We have a healthier world now. You know, it's a little softer. It's a little more sensitive. I do like the old school part oh, for sure. of the world, but it is it's healthier for you know our next generation, our kids, to be able to express themselves and get the help and the resources that they need. Yeah, and you talked about, like, sophomore year, you think about going to Portal. One thing I always try to tell these, uh, like, high school kids, when they're making a college decision, like, make it for yourself. You know what I mean? Because if somebody else make it for your college, your high school coach or somebody like that, and it don't work out, you're blaming them for it. 
But if you put yourself in that position, you like I can I can sit here and I can fight through it. I can make that adjustment. And it's tough as a kid, right? You're only like 17, 18 years old. Even deciding to go to school, your parents are a big influence on where you mm-hmm. go. I mean, I always thought I could play anywhere, but going to Carolina, I'm like, shit. I wasn't the top. I made McDonald's, but I wasn't like one of those guys. You know what I'm saying? It was like, damn, if I go to Carolina, I might not play. And I didn't. <laughs> I didn't play until my senior year. I had to fight to get into that. Um, so even when I was thinking about transferring, it was like, all right, what's a better fit for me? Because I wasn't playing. And also, what's closer to home? Because I had issues going on back at the crib. Uh, so, you know, just going through that process and becoming a man and learning how to make decisions on your own, it's tough. And finding out who you are and what's best for you, you kind of don't really know that at that point, but you're still figuring it out. So, you know, these young kids now said it's easier to yeah. figure out. And they, now they can move better and get paid. And also, if things don't work out in a situation they don't like, they can figure out and still play without having to sit out a year or do this and that. So that it's a better space for the young kids and they're getting more of what they deserve. And as it said, the resources around them are making it, you know, healthier mentally and for them to grow up fast. We have to have so much more information. Yeah. You know, I had to go to the library, J Dub, say <laughs> back in the day. There was no Google on the phones. You had you know, yeah. you got Google they can learn. They got TikTok, they learn so much on social media that they're way smarter than us earlier. So they're maturing faster, which helps them to become adults and you know, make decisions for themselves. Back when we were younger, it was really hard. We just had to trust in our coaches. We should trust in our AU coaches program and our parents like, yeah, this might be the best fit for you. It's like well, all right, I guess I'm going to fucking, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, this is works for me. So, uh, But now it says kids are able to grow up, and now they're getting more freedoms to do it, and they're encouraging more to make decisions earlier to where they can you know, grow up faster and become mature adults by the time they, they make a decision to go to college. Yeah, so you was able to learn under one of the most respected coaches of all time, Coach Pop. Uh, I just always want to know, like, how was it being coached by him and how he makes each and every player come out and be a better player version of themselves and their leadership. Because I always respected Pop, like, you know what I mean, going to USA Select Team, being around him, just hearing him talk about mm-hmm. the game and the respect that he has. I always wish I had the opportunity to be coached by him. So I want to know how that experience uh, was. Yeah, I want to I ask you how your experience with him was during the USA Team, because he's a different guy in season. He, not everybody can play. Yeah, well, I you know think USA, I think, like, he was joking and laughing a lot more. And it's like he yeah. wasn't the, the head coach at the time, but, like, just being around his presence, just trying to pick his knowledge as much as possible. But I know it's totally different been in a full season under him, then, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, it's like when I first got to Coach Cal, like, you know what I mean, just talking to him before I played for him, I'm like, all right, he's cool. But then we, when it's yeah. starting, you get between those four lines and you got 20 suicides in 20 minutes at 6 a.m., I'm like, oh, I think I picked the wrong school. So I would love to know, like, your experience yeah. with Pop was. So I was lucky enough to have a, a crazy high school coach. Shout out to Coach Tim Kloos. Uh He coached me at St. Mary's, then he coached Iona. We had success and, and um, then ended up, having issues and also transferring and going to different schools and went to Long Island, you know, CW Post in Long Island. Um, but he was crazy. So he prepared me for Coach Williams and then who prepared me for Pop to handle him. But like I said, not everybody can play for Pop. And off the court, he's great. You know, grandpa jokes, comedian. You know, I can't stop laughing. As I got older, I got more comfortable with asking, but you just, his presence is like fear. Like you're just scared, nervous. You want to be, it's like the principal. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? You want to be on your P's and Q's and, and when he said something, you listen. You ta- you chimed in mind because your first instance of it, like when you get with him, he's gonna let you know that you're not safe by cussing out Timmy, Tony, and Manu. So like when you get there, it's like all right, new guys here. Even no matter who we're playing, he's gonna call a timeout and rip somebody, and it's gonna be somebody you don't expect them to rip. And you're like, damn, that just puts you on. You're already you're already scared of him, but now you're like, damn, if you cuss out Timmy like that. I know I'm not safe. <laughs> So I was like, I better make sure I do my job. Um, but, yeah, he, on the court, most intense guy. He loves the game, very passionate study, but most intense in your face, depending on who you are. He knows who can handle what, but he's going to push you. They put you, I wouldn't say in a box, but they put you in a position to where your strengths are and so you can be successful in that and figure out how to way to push the right buttons to get you to play at your – like, so if they say, oh, we know John plays better when he's angry. You know what? He – we play so-and-so on Thursday. This is Sunday. We play fucking – who knows? It might be a weaker team. We're going to play them. Right now, I might cuss you out to get you angry for that game Thursday. Like, that's the type of things Pop will do. It's like a chess mm-hmm. game. It's like, all right, I know you're chasing so-and-so. He may not be as good chasing Kyle Culver, but you better be on your fuck because we got Clay Thompson and Seth Curry. So if you don't do your job chasing JJ, I'm going to cuss you out and take you out, and you'll be sitting in the doghouse to where I know that that you're going to be built up to where you're going to take the game seriously, have a sense of urgency. So when you're chasing these other guys, you're going to be ready, and then you're going to have one of your better performances. So he's really good at that. 
playing the chess game, but also just like getting the best out of you and putting you in positions to be successful. Like, all right, this is what you're good at. You're going to do that and you're going to perfect this. You're going to be elite at this. You don't need to work. You can work on some of that weaknesses here and there, but no, you're good at floaters and penetrating and pitching and finding guys, so you're going to do that. You shoot a three occasionally in the corners. So of Tony was really not shooting many threes outside of the corner threes when he's wide open. You facilitate. If you don't have an open shot, you find somebody and you, you know, do that. So, they were really good with that, not just Pop, but the assistant coaches as well. Danny, do you have like a crazy or funny Pop story that that won't leave your head? Like you always come to when people ask. There's a thousand of them. It depends on situation. You know, um, <laughs> there's final situations. There's preseason situations. I, I always love preseason Pop because he's very more. He's a lot more lackadaisical. Yeah. Our preseasons were pretty light because we had older guys. He messed with some of the new guys coming in, cuss out the old guys, scare the new guys, and also. Throw them because he ain't afraid to. If you're new, to throw you in the fire. So you get a call up and you're just, oh, I'm like, I'm just here to cheer guys on. No, first quarter he's gonna throw you in the game to see if you're fucking ready. Like yo, go, oh John, let's go. And you're like, I just got here. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't even know the fucking place. Get in there. You know what I'm saying? He's gonna he's gonna call your number. Um, so I always enjoyed when he'd mess with those guys and, and randomly select starters and see how the reaction is and, and you make some jokes. So I have a thousand pop stories that stand out. And every time we went to dinner, I remember going to dinner with him as I got older. And was comfortable enough to ask him questions about like some of the things he did when he played. And he's like, "Oh, you know, I got fucking cut for so and so. They they picked the wrong guy. You know, I should have been playing." <laughs> and you know, his first experience, uh, you know, when certain things got legal, when we got legal, you know, his first experience. Have you ever tried? Have you ever tried drugs before? He's like, you know, I, he told a long story. But I tried it one time. It didn't go well. I didn't know where I was at, and I never tried it again. Like something like that. Nervous. So those things always stand out for me. Funny as hell, but those things I would never ask when I was a kid. I would ask when I was older. It's like, all right, he's more comfortable telling me. And I've been with him for six, seven years. It's like, all right, he's you know, I did this one time. I was hanging out with this girl. I dropped her off. I forgot I dropped her off, and I was like, he's like, where's uh Jenny or something like that? And he's, he's, I never did it again. I never tried it again. Damn. So yeah. Hey, how well do you think women can flourish under him, and how can he still connect with the young players? He's adjusted well, man. Um, I think he's had to, especially with with the Kawhi situation, and then when. DeMar came over and LaMarcus came over. He had different personalities he had to adjust and adapt to because those guys, not saying that they're not humble guys, but they're not like Timmy, Tony, Mono. Like, you know, the foreigners are just different. Um, you know, LaMarcus, humble guy, but still like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, these guys are superstars. Kawhi, Super DeMar, they used to be in the guys in their system before they came over. And then we had Becky. So he had Becky. Um, she kind of interned first and then he helped, she helped. And now she's doing her thing with yeah. the women's side. She's doing an amazing yeah. thing. Um, so he's had descendants all over the, the, the league, all over the world, playing, coaching in Europe. Um, so I think he's done an amazing job allowing people to grow and also to learn his system. Just not, you know, women, men, kids, everybody you see that's, he's touched. Like I said, you can, him, certain people have the Midas touch, you know what I'm saying? Like they always find ways to sprinkle it into people and they become successful. You know, you see it in Miami. You see it, you even see LeBron and his people with clutch, you know, that type of thing. Um, certain guys that he puts in certain positions, even his guys, that he's able to make their platforms or whatever grow. Um, Pop is one of those guys, and he's able to do it not only with men, but on the women's side as well. Danny, going back to one of your championships, uh, 2020 Lakers, the internet, you know, Lakers haters, of course, are out there. They they like to say, discount yeah. the bubble. <laughs> they call it, oh, the Disney championship, the bubble, the Mickey or whatever. What is your response to people who say that that title was easier? I mean, to each their own. You know, everybody has their opinion. It, it, you know, everybody has one. Some of them matter, some of them don't. Some of them hold more weight than others, depending on where you've been and what you've done. Um, to me, it was the hardest one, mentally, physically, emotionally. It's just tough. It, that's a, and I've spoken on this multiple times, hundreds of times. Um, no matter how nice you make an area, it's still tough to be yeah. in it. And it was a really nice resort. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But being in that space for 100 days, the first two months without your family, friends, girlfriends, wives, etc. And then being with them confined in a small space, uh, no matter how much you golf, no matter how much you go to restaurants or walk around the facilities, it it, it closes in on you. And um, it was it was tough. It, it was tough. But um, what's that? It, we, it was well worth it. We got a chance to win. We got out of there with the win. Because I can imagine being on the other side of it. You're Miami. You have to go 100 days and then come out and lose. <laughs> that's got to be to go home with yeah. that. That's got to be a tough mm-hmm. one because even years that we did lose when we weren't in the bubble. It was a tough summer for me. We had short summers. We lost to Miami. Short summer, tough one. And I got a chance to travel world and do whatever and kind of like try to take my mind off of it. When you're in COVID in the bubble and all you can think about, and that's the only thing going on. 
when you're a basketball fan and just a, ba- a basketball, like, you know, it's just your passion. It's hard to get your, get away from it, and it could wear on you a, a lot mentally. Mm. So there's so many young, talented yeah. guards in the league right now. Who you think is, like, yeah. your top five, you think, right now? Because it's like, you know, the game has changed. It's so different from it's when different we play. You, know what I mean? you can't, be, you yeah. can't be as physical. I mean, you know, so – I want to like, like what? J Dub, I already know, bro. We defensive guys. We're able to, you know, be physical guards. I know, because somebody just told defense. me the other day, no I had anymore. said it on the OG's podcast, and I was like, it's it's so different now. It's a lot, it's just really about scoring. Like, you know what I mean? A lot of shots, a lot of scoring. And just imagine, like, when you first came in, you could shoot 15 to 17 threes in one game. You might be at the record, you know what I mean? And somebody, somebody told me, like, you don't play defense. I was like, if you don't think I did, that's your choice. I'm not about to argue with you. Like, you got your own point. But I just like to see like where everybody's point of view because you came in a, a year right before me, and and know how it is like how the game was played and like how do you see like who you think is your top five guard? You think is special right now? To your point, it has changed a lot um, the game, and I know you. I remember I seen the clip. You said it's hard to watch at times. It was just all offense. I do like the fact Adam Silver is trying to figure out a way mm-hmm. to let defenses because they did change the rules a little bit. You know, Trey used to. James had his sw- swipe through his arms. Can't Trey, play you, can't play. Own you have arm. They find yeah. He stopped, jump backwards. You can't even defensively. They got screeners. Um, the, the toughest thing that they said these guys are so good. It makes it even harder when you let guys set legal screens. You let them carry the ball. Trey, will, you know what I'm saying? Certain guys will carry, look, make a decision, shoot, pass, put the ball back on the floor, double step backs. Now, like mm. it's, a, it's a different game. Um, but the young group for me, man, I, I love. And I said I'm biased because some of these kids I got to play with and watch up close. And, you know, Tyrese Maxey is one of them. Desmond Bain, I got to see John Morant. Um, if, he, you know, things go in the right direction for him, those are young guys. But guys that I didn't get a chance to see or match up with or play with, Anthony Edwards, I got a chance to play against him, but he's starting to come into it. You know, he's one of my favorite guys. Well, he's must see TV, yeah. night in, night out. Like said it, yeah. They're playing Utah Jazz. Mm. Know, nobody cares to see a Minnesota-Utah Jazz game. But when he's doing shit like that, you got put to. people on posters, <clears throat> you got to watch him. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I got to see what he's going to do and night in, night out. Um, there's some young guys that I just like the way they hoop. Jalen Brunson's playing really well. Ty Talbert had a great stretch early on. Right now he's struggling, but I do I love the way he plays the game. Um, but it said some when it comes from Bigs, Segun from Houston, um, I can see him being a, another Jokic. Yeah, I told up. a lot and of people really about good. him when I was there earlier on. I said he's gonna he got a chance to be special. I've seen him up close and personal. When you see it, so you don't really know until you see when you get a chance to see it up close, you're like, all right, just, I knew Tyrese Maxey was going to be so just the way he carried himself. Like, yo, he's going to be good. Like, he's going to, I didn't think he was going to be super. I wasn't showing him superstar that fast. But I'm like, yo, and then when I was seeing him, like, he's going to be a star. And you could see it. Um, Sagan was another good big. Wemby, I haven't got a chance to see him up close, but just watching how he moves, I'm not going to lie. Like, at first, I was like, eh, you might have another ball ball situation. I, don't, I just couldn't see a 7 5 guy being effective and being that light and thin. Uh, but in today's game, the floor is stretched, him and Chet. Those guys are going to be young and up and coming. Jalen Williams, another kid. Mm-hmm. Um, there we go. Sleep on. That that backcourt, man, those those kids are unbelievable. They really deserve their flowers, offensively and defensively. They're going to be – OKC is going to be – and you know, we were making fun of OKC just a year or two ago. Like, they're so terrible. Why? You know what I'm saying? They have all these picks. Why are they not using them, getting rid of them? They're going to be bad for – They Shea's really turned that organization around and then bringing Jalen Williams aboard and then Chet getting healthy. So, you know, so those are some of the young guys that I – I, I like to watch and said, I want to see Ja get back. But I think the NBA is in a good space right now because everybody's like wondering when Bron is gone, when the old school guy is gone. Is the league, I think the league is in really good hands right now and a good space with hopefully Zion staying healthy and all these other guys that I just mentioned uh, coming into their own and coming into their prime. Danny, t- staying on yeah. the, the young guys conversation, you know, we have the Thunder, we had the Timberwolves kind of hovering that one and two spot, but everyone's still picking the Nuggets. Everyone's still picking, you know, Celtics to make it there. Yeah. So is, is experience, can you talk about how that experience kind of like really comes into play in the playoffs? Huge, man, because when it comes down to the playoffs, the game slows down as fourth quarter execution, you know, um, and that's what's ex- with experience. If you haven't been there before, you don't know how you're going to react. You don't know how your players going to react when it comes to coach. Also, coaching. You don't know how coaches going to react. They may overcoach. They may not know what play to call, who to, to put in. They may not trust this guy or trust that. When it's like, all right. And it all comes down to, when it, when I think of playoffs, it comes down to not only your stars, but your X factors. And is the coach going to put those guys in the position to, to help save the group? You know what I'm saying? It might be like, uh, say, if it's not Boston, say Minnesota, say, all right, we got, uh, what's the other, other, who's coming off the bench? Mike Conley, obviously he's a vet, but like we another got, young kid. Like Nas Reed the off wing. the bench. Nas Monte Reed, Moore's. 
McDaniels. Uh, Alexander, uh, yeah, Jaden McDaniels, Alexander Walker. Like those guys, those are the guys they're going to need to step up. You know what I'm saying? Anthony Edwards is going to do what he does. Cat's going to do what he does. Gobert, Mike Conley. But like when it comes to the playoffs, the game slows down. We need somebody to, to come out of their, their own and, and win us a series, win us a game. And that could be like one of those guys. When it comes to OKC, it may not be Chet Jalen or, you know, it might be Isaiah Joe coming off the bench. You know, we need him to score 15 for us. If he averaged 15 for the series, that changes the whole thing. The other team didn't game plan for that. Um, so experience is huge when it comes to the playoffs because playoffs, when it comes down to it, every team knows everybody's plays and it comes executing for 48 minutes or for longer of the 48 minutes another team. And usually that comes down to experience and knowing each other. Den- Denver and Jamal and Jokic, they know each other so well. It's like, they, all right, fourth quarter, we know what we're doing. San Antonio, we have four four players. Everybody knew when they were coming. They still couldn't stop them because we just knew each other so well. It's like we knew – they cut this off as another option. Tony coming back door, so and so Manu here, and it was just all. Ex- and some guys that in that moment, even though they they know the plays, they might get nervous and mess it up because they don't have that experience. They're just like, oh, the bright the lights might get to them. You don't know how they're going to react in those moments when it comes down to executing in front of twenty thousand fans screaming on the road, and, and when you know there's something on the line. So, um, experience plays a huge factor when it comes to winning a championship. For sure. I mean, we was playing in the playoffs. And early on, we had Trevor Reza and Nene, and they taught us so much about, like, I didn't know. You know, like, the first possession, somebody, like, it don't mean nothing. I remember I didn't get back. <laughs> Trevor cussed me out so bad. He's like, no, every fucking possession means something. And it really does. But, like, Danny said, like, you know everybody play. You know they want to run. I remember, um, mm-hmm. I think it was 2014 while we playing Indiana. And we mm-hmm. knew they was running the side pick and roll with George Hill and David West pocket pass with – you couldn't help because Paul George in a strong corner. So it was like, how do we stop it? Like, we knew the play, but it was just bread and butter. So experience definitely comes a factor into it. Like, my first time in the playoffs, we didn't know. We knew we wanted to run in the fourth quarter, but we were just nervous. We never was in that position before. But then the next year after that, I finally had that experience understood. And then my last year, 2017, we lost to the Celtics. We knew IT was going to kill. He was going to do his thing. You know what I mean? He was scoring mm-hmm. at a high level. But game seven, Kelly Leonard went for like 15 in the fourth quarter that we didn't expect. And – didn't plan for, but at least y'all had the experience. Like it took yes. year after year to like finally, all right, feel comfortable in that space. Yeah. And he said every every possession matters. The, the start of the game to the end because it sets the tone. That first possession sets the tone. And I remember the year that we won it in 2014. We came back the next year. It was wild in the West. We lost the game. We was two seed. Lost the last game of the season. It ended up being a seven seed. We played the Clippers in the first round. <laughs> and this is when I think they might have had. Cause I don't know. It was a short season where we had back to backs in the playoffs, which was crazy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was a two seed versus seven seed. And it's us, the Clippers. Really should be a Western Conference final matchup, but it's a first round matchup. And to start the game, we're, I'm guarding JJ. We're chasing that, and we're shutting down JJ because JJ's first quarter. He's getting everything. Shot yeah, play first quarter. We're yeah. like not shutting him down, but we keeping him contained. You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, Matt Barnes is getting threes. So I'm like, what the fuck? And Kawhi is guarding him. You know, and they're like, and it's like, yo, Timmy's like, yo, you can't, we can't allow this to happen. Like, you can't, like, for Timmy to say something, you know, go at Kawhi in a, in a huddle and let him know, like, yo, wake up. You know, this is time. It don't matter. First quarter, four, like, this first possession. You got to make sure you don't, you can't let guys like this hurt us. We can't prepare. For, we prepare for JJ to score 10 to 15. We can't prepare for Matt Barnes to score nine points in the first quarter. Like, Nah, he's supposed to stay under his four points or within that. Mm-hmm. If he affects the game, that changes the whole – like, yo, now we got to stop other guys. So all those possessions matter, man. And and Tony was a big – and Timmy, all those guys were big on, like, letting you know when you're messing up and when you need to execute and be on your P's and Q's. Like, look, don't dick around. Like, you need to be awake. Wake the fuck And that pop was great at that, too. He cuts everybody out. Anyway. Um, I got a question for both you guys because uh, UNC and Kentucky, mm-hmm. going back to college a little bit with the tournament coming up, wanted to ask you if you guys could build your all-time five from your respective schools, so UNC versus Kentucky, who do you think would win? Mm-hmm. They have a great, they have a great alum, man, unbelievable. But when we have Mike, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just a cheat code. <laughs> we have Mike. You know, it, it's it's tough to to compete with. We got Mike Vince. We got stack. We got guys in our even our second unit would be pretty good. I know as of late our alum hasn't been as good. So like if you go by era, it'd be a, a tough. Like Kentucky could probably get us in you know certain maybe 2010s. You know what I'm saying? Like late like our a lot of our guys back in the day with Sam Perkins, like Antoine Jameson, mm-hmm. Vince said stack. Um, there's so many guys that we can list off, but if you go by error, it'll be a, a tough matchup. But if you go all time, I think it's tough when you have Mike, Vince, Stag, Tuan Jameson, Sheed. Um, I mean, and this is before even college played, but Tyler, Tyler had his great run in, the, in, the, in college. Tyler Hansborough had a great 
college career. So, and I recently had a, a rankings of like the best college careers. And he I has to be up there. He has to be. Yeah. For and sure. It, 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 it was interesting to me to see like that they did a lot of one and dones. But we have we have a really it, it'd be a hell of a matchup. I'll tell you that. Yeah. You, regardless of what the lineups are. Because you got said so fuck A D cuz y'all got all That's those guys. Yeah, man. Murray. You go back, you got Mad Burn. So it's just, so it's, you hit it right now. Like it depends on what Erica the game is so different. And I say so this all the time because somebody just I think uh Boog and Matt Barnes just had one about like UCLA versus Kentucky and they was like putting their teams <laughs> together. And stack stack uh, Steven Jackson was like, Hell no, Matt, the team you put together don't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause like I mean if you now old enough to cause back when we idolized those guys, they're still great. But when you mm-hmm. watch the eighties and nineties, the basketball was so different. Like completely different. The skill set now is like, yo, A D is shooting three like their bigs weren't shooting threes back then, you know what I'm saying? Like able to handle the ball. Cuz was handling the ball, shooting threes, doing a like that's a tough matchup for uh, yeah. fucking Antoine Jameson. That's a tough matchup for Sheed, um any of those guys playing the big spot. So it's this is it's different games hard to compare. Um I do love the way the game is growing though. And I do still respect the, old, the elders, the older guys that paved the way for us, and they are great. But these these kids nowadays, man, are doing stuff that we, step backs and euro steps. We weren't doing that shit in high school. No, you get called for travels. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't know what it was. I mean, first time I you step in high school, coach, the ref called travel. I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, you must not be watching NBA. He said, I do not watch no NBA. They so, showed a clip of the first euro step. I think it was Dominique Wilkins back yeah, in the day. Yeah. <laughs> It was I bad. It somewhere and they called the travel. They called the travel. And I'm like, that's a clean move. It was nice. I think you might have missed it, but it was smooth. They didn't know what it was because they didn't know what it was. They just called the travel. I was like, damn, back in the 80s, I actually tried it. it was yeah. let it, let was it Ginobili getting called so, for him early on? No, 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 no. He's one of the first that he's one of the first. He to set the trend bring it over. Yeah. Yeah, he, used to, he was one of the trendsetters. And then obviously, you know, James kind of made it a perfect, like, perfected that. And then the step back and the double step yeah. back. But the Euros are the ones that kind of brought it over and, and made it more. Like they normalized it, so where it's like, oh, yeah, we do this in Europe. In Europe, they call more travels there than they do here. So, in an NBA, they they want to see entertainment. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to call as many travels. Depending on who you are, they're not calling carries and travels no. and double dribbles. You know, certain guys, certain guys may get it, but it's like if it's a special player and he acts like he knows what he's doing, it's clean. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, okay. You know what I mean? Brian might do a spin move, and so you're like, oh, just Brian, he, he, he yeah. did it like he was confident. Well, Giannis coming. Be- it's like Giannis yeah. coming in transition, like. It's, you know you can do you taking three steps like I barely can stop him taking two steps so it's like Man. pick and choose so the tournament getting close how far you think Carolina can go cause we I, I both like we both year. both five teams had just at least y'all made it to the ACC championship but my team fell in the first round which I was yeah. upset about but you know like I was saying earlier to CJ it's like it's tough to win nine straight like I mean win the conference yeah. tournament then to go so no, like, you need that loss you need that loss that loss is necessary and every time we won the ACC title we lost in the tournament so that's why I didn't care if Carolina won the ACC t- like the conference uh, tournament uh, because I wanted us to have a better chance because winning the tournament is hard to go in you need that you need a little edge or you need a chip on your shoulder so I, I like our chance I don't like the fact that we lost NC State in the championship game I didn't want us to win it though but the <laughs> fact that we lost to them I'm like damn <laughs> yeah, NC right State down the you know road. Saying? yeah um, but they knocked Duke out, so it was like cool, whatever. NC State would let them have that. But um, I like our chances. I do like Kentucky's chances as well. I think this is one of the years that we can can get it done for sure. Get to the Final Four would be nice. If so, I'll be covering them on Yahoo. But um, we have a good group, and I think our bracket is pretty. I want to say easy, but it's one of the easier ones. It's, it's pretty smooth. Yeah, you I know, our selection deep. Sunday go. You be like, what? <laughs> yeah. You pick these, man. You be like, You're how do I get the hardest one. bracket? Yeah, UConn I think has the toughest one. Kentucky has a pretty good one. Like y'all in Yeah, the, second round we bracket. might have Texas or NC State if they win. Yeah, but Purdue has a pretty smooth one. We have a pretty pretty good one. So I like our bracket. I don't like the fact that we might have to save Michigan, see Michigan State second, second or third game, and then Baylor's in our bracket. But outside of that, UConn's got Illinois, Auburn, all them to Kentucky. Yeah. Y'all got some, some – some, depending on – y'all got a bracket where the guys are in, injuries. So, like, Houston, they're a little shaky. Yeah, I, th- I think I feel like Houston head. Houston gets there every year, and then like right around the tournament time, they start to fall apart. Like they have a good team every year. I don't know. I think the Marquette guard might be out, right? The All American. Yeah, 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 their season is based on that, whether he can get healthy or not and get back. Um, Wisconsin has a good, decent group. I have some sleepers, but I think y'all can definitely come out. Y'all can make it out. Oh, we should. But, uh, the I, most. I, I like our, I like our chances. Though. I like our chances with our bracket. Yeah, for us, the most important thing for us, like we can score the ball at a high level. I just think they have to lock in 
defense. You know how it is. Like yeah. to them, like the way they play defense when they went to Tennessee the last game of the regular season and won. If they can play that defense, they have a great chance to go all the way. Y'all got a lot of talent, a lot of NBA players. Mm-hmm. I still, you have a mix. I think you have on the younger younger side. You have to rely on some younger guys to like keep it consistent because they've been yeah. great all season. Now it's like tournament time. Are you gonna when the lights are bright? Oh, are this is when it matters. More shine matter. moment. So are they gonna Are they gonna keep it going? You have to win your losses. That's why I tell people in the tournament. You got to win your losses. The mm-hmm. nights when you play shitty, you have to find a way to get a W. So I think Carolina at least makes the Final Four. I'll be happy with that. If they have to face like a UConn or somebody in the Final Four and they lose, I'm like, all right, I understand. This. Connecticut is unbelievable, but I, I'm hoping that somebody knocks them out early. I think Auburn might be able to get them. Yeah, I think that's like the most team that's like complete. Like they just know who they are. Like they know who they are. They yeah. brought a lot of guys back from last year. They just completely know who they are. But I'm mm-hmm. super excited for the tournament time. I think I might sneak down to the Final Four and see. It's going to be a fun one, man. It's in Phoenix, so it ain't a bad place to be. No. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Danny, I wanted to ask you, because you had an interesting thing in your career. You played with 2009 LeBron, and then you played with 2020 LeBron. Were there specific differences yeah. between the two different LeBrons? He was still the same. He was a big kid, but he found he knew how to win at that point. He learned how to, when he went down to Spo in Miami, he knew how important the details and execution was. He always had a great mind for the game. He always understood the game. He knew it greatly. He was a big – so that had Shaq, too, at the time. Big-ass kids, you know, played a lot, played around a lot, lot like a lot, a lot of fun. Um, but said he knew how to take it serious. He knew what he needed around him to get it done. And he also knew the details of, like, yo, now nah, we can walk through. Let's go over that again. I don't like that. I don't like him there. Let's make – let's get this. Let's change that. Nah. And because we'll, some people go through shit around, like, we all hate shit around. Fucking pointless. <laughs> Getting but up early you, for no you reason. Take them serious, yeah, for no reason. During the season, it's like, all right, we played these guys last week. We don't need this. But in the playoffs, walkthroughs, if you take them serious, you, get, you can get something out of it, especially mental. It's like, all right, make sure. So we know we're going over this. This is what they're going to do. And when they do do this, make this adjustment, what are we going to adjust to? Um, so, yeah, he was big on that and the details. He, I think he learned that when he got to Miami. So that's the only difference outside of that. Still a big-ass kid, man. <laughs> like to have fun um, and play the game. It's just – so there's times where he can go off, and there's times he said he's going to make the game easier for you. And so during there's times where it's like, all right, he's going to challenge you. So it's like, yo, you better step up to the plate, and he's going to make sure you, you better be there. Or he's going to be like, yo, you're not doing your job. So you just want to make sure you're, you're on your, your P's and Q's too to, to not let him or the rest of the group down. So now you on your, now you got your own podcast called Inside the Green Room with Danny Green. Like, how do you feel about, like, you know what I mean, taking that next step of going into that and being into the podcast field. Yeah, man, I love it, man. Especially the fact that everybody's doing it, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Seeing you guys, seeing you have your own, Bron, JJ, all those guys. I, I'm This is year six for me. I've been doing it. And I started doing it right when we, right before the trade. Me and Kawhi got traded to Toronto. Um, it was just another way to, for me because I always know what I wanted to do after ball and I wanted to get into the media space. Because um, coaching, I, I think I'd be good at it, but I just think it's too stressful. I don't want to. I don't want to mess with it, man. I'm saying I like to keep my hair the color it is, and I like to keep my hair. I don't want to be going bald. People going bald, getting gray hair. And you know the stress as a player, man. Like, we take on a lot. There's a house. I can imagine relying on other grown men for, to keep your job stability. Like, it's just an unstable job for me. So I wanted to get into the media space. So this was ultimately me getting reps, talking in front of the camera, presenting myself, how to talk the game, how to give thoughts, breakdowns in certain time periods. Um, also give my opinion, also have a platform, have a voice to use it for other things when COVID's happening, when uh, Black Math, Black Lives Matter movements are happening, uh, talking in, you know, in a political space. Uh, but also, you know, allowing players to have, it, it ultimately change us to have more power and say so with guys, you know, being mistreated in the, the org, like industry. And so there's hell of, a lot of stories of guys, certain GMs doing the wrong way, certain coaches doing the wrong way. Coaches and GMs are less likely to do that now when guys are able to talk in their their own space freely about you know their experiences, um, and also said to have more power what they want to do, where they want to go, and and, and to, you know players are frowned upon when they were asking for trades when they want to go here, um, you know you, and a lot of fans they they only see what the media prints. Say right? it again. Say it again. So they're always going to take a ne- the negative, the dramatic, con- like the content that always draws you. Oh, so and so wants to trade. So and so doesn't like this. And it's like, yo, I said this. It takes small bits and pieces of what you're saying, and not the full story, just to get clicks. And now that also allows us to be like, yo, yeah, I said this, but this is what I meant. It's not how I said that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's all context and tone. And it's like they can take one small thing and take it out. Now it's like players are able to like, look, this is what I was thinking. Now that fans get an insight, 
this is oh this is what really was happening uh, he's not just a dummy he didn't make this mistake or he didn't just say that or he's not trying to come at his teammate or he's not trying to stir up shit he's just saying his opinion look I, this is how i felt it was like D- D-Lo's having his podcast now he's going he's getting heat like because he's giving his opinion of his relationship with darvin ham so yo i'm just telling you how i saw he had a better relationship with him like, why the hell y'all you know what i'm saying i'm just saying small things and y'all taking out of context but so I, that's what i love about the space i love that players are able to use their power for, you know more than and their voices for you know other things outside of basketball but also on the basketball court to be handled and treated the way they should be treated danny one one last question um and appreciate you coming mm-hmm. on here can, can you just speak of a course. little bit about because if i'm not mistaken you're, you're not done playing like you're staying ready no right? no no. like tell it tell us a little bit about Absolutely. how complicated and how like interesting that is is like you're available but also you're making moves to be ready for post-career so tell us a little bit about that it, um i've been said i've been lucky to be put in situations where people prepared me for the future and see the bigger picture way before it happened so i've been doing this for a couple of years i went to the sports cast to you because like people when they're done playing it's a real shock for them and they're not ready for it, and they don't know how to adjust it. They don't know how to handle it. So as tough as it is still not being able to play, watch it's hard to watch NBA games when you're not playing. J.W., I already know you know how this is. Knowing you can get out there like, oh, I could I could literally do this. Oh, I could help a team. I could do, you know what I'm saying? So it's hard to watch the game and not feel a way or not have a bias. And said, so Let alone if you had nothing else going on. Luckily, I'm trying to keep busy to keep my mind off it, to do media stuff, do that. Um so, you know, people told, told me earlier, get into this now. Don't wait till later. So I got into that, doing the sportscast of you, doing the podcast, doing tournament time. But in the same breath, busting my ass physically, make sure I'm in the gym, you know, every day. And if a call does happen, I'm ready. You know what I'm saying? I'm, not, I'm, I'm prepared. And when the team does see me, it's like, oh, you know, he's not just here to be a cheerleader or to, you know what I'm saying, be a veteran at the end of the bench to teach us some things. Like, no, we can actually use this guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, we might want to keep him for next year. And so it's tough. It's tough when you're going through it because, I'm a little more old school. I'm not the type to post my workouts. And when you don't post it or you don't record it, it's like, oh, it didn't happen. Or people don't, people forget about you quickly. You know, people don't know what you're doing. And I, I'm, you know, I fall victim to it too. It's like, yo, shit. When when John was out the league, I'm like, ah, I've seen him play. And I'm like, all right, I think he can hoop. But I'm like, I don't know, what is it? You know, if people, if people don't see you play on that level. It's like, oh, I don't know. They'll discredit it, or he's not ready, or he can't fit. And I'm like, I think John could play. I think he definitely could. Play. He definitely could help a team to hoop. Some some I had arguments with him. He's like, he'll have a 15, seven to seven. I'm like. Nah, nah, no way. Then he gets on the court and he plays with Clippers like shit. John could easily average 15, 7, 15 and 7. You know I'm saying like 7 assists, 15 points. Um, just because I haven't seen him do it. I've seen enough of some of the workouts. But people said in this day and age, it's a tough battle between promoting yourself. I'm not one of those people and showing it, recording it uh, and to show you that you're ready. It's like, yo, I'm ready. And, and a lot of people won't believe it or, or put faith in you or give you a chance or opportunity unless they see you doing those things. And it's like, it's a tough battle every day for me. It's like, yo, do I need it? But I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep staying ready. I'm going to keep, because I didn't do all this rehab to just fucking retire. I did all, I, I tore my ACL, LCL, all that hamstring, and, and I came back in eight months. I didn't do all that just to be like, all right, call it quits. Nah, I'm trying to get the most out of it and play, because I can do media forever. I could do that until I'm 90 years old. You know, I could, basketball, you only do so a certain time. Yeah. So I'm going to try to play <clears throat> as long as, because I don't want to leave the court with no regrets. When I hang them up, it's like, you know what? I had nothing else left to give. I gave the game all I got. But, um, yes, I'm staying ready physically, basketball-wise. I'm still working out. But I'm doing other things to keep me busy so that it's not as tough mentally and emotionally on me. And I just had, you know, had a little one. The little one's six, seven months now. Congrats, so he keeps congrats. me positive. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. So it keeps it keeps me young. It keeps me you know, focusing on the positive. But I'm very much in shape and ready to help a team. And I could help a team. I can still shoot the ball. <laughs> I can still get corner to corner. I can still play a little defense. And it's like I said, not many people playing great defense. So it's like, I'm not going to be a liability out there. But I can still do, you know, things that can help a team and just wait on that call, man. Yeah, you hit it right on the note, though. You definitely got to stay ready, but you also got to do other things so you don't get frustrated, get so stressed. Like, me being able to take my kids to school, watch them play soccer, watch them go to boxing, like, that's the only thing that's keeping me sane because, like you say, you're watching the game, you're like, man, I know I can do this. I know I can help a team. But like you say, you're just in a different space sometimes where you can't really can control. And like for me, I'm like, I'm going to post this workout. Then I was like, man, I'm not about to post everything because sometimes you post and they're like, well, you're not playing against nobody or you're not That's doing this. Oh, he's playing against this. So he's just gonna, they're going to discredit it either way. And right? I'm like, so, in the summertime, you got teams that come down here or it's all pros that be in Miami where I'm playing. I'm like, well, this is not just anybody that's from the park or don't have a name. But 
How you say I, you find you find that space where you feel like you're comfortable with what's next for you, but you still stay ready. Like you said, until you're ready to give it up, you'll know when the time is. When you feel like you got something left, you're going to continue to work. It's a it's an everyday battle, man, because half of your friends are going to be like, yo, keep going, and half your friends are going to be like, yo, you had a great career. And you know, <laughs> I ain't trying to hear that last part. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not either, man. Yeah, but you but do then, hear it, though. You, you do. Podcasts, you see you see other people sending you, like, reti- like Jamal Crawford. Like, I've had a great career, man, and, and unfortunately, said I never was a superstar. And even superstars don't get the opportunity to end their career the way they want to. Carmelo, Dwight, like there's a bunch of guys. It just happens abruptly. And you're seeing all these podcasts and guys telling their story like, damn, I gave the game so much. I might not be able to, you know, end it the way I wanted, to, even if I did it the right way. Regardless if you're a great locker room guy, regardless if you have three championships, they don't really give a damn. It's what have you done for me lately? Yeah. What can you do? They don't care. So me coming to terms with like not being, I'm not saying I'm going to be okay with it, but be able to handle like, all right, even though I bust my ass and I don't get the call. I, I gave it my all and like, all right, I can find ways to adapt and adjust to it and understand like, you know, life is not always going to happen the way you would think it's or what you want. You might have, so you can do everything right and still not get the opportunity. Um, but how do you bounce back from that? What are you going to do next? What, what is the other avenue? Um, so, yeah, I understand it. I get it. I don't like it. You know, when you're old and you have injuries, people may not give you the opportunity. But the fact that, that I've seen so many other guys have their careers end abruptly and they're just not like Kenya Martin talks about on Gil's podcast. It's like, all right, I understand. And the fact that I'm prepared for it, it allows me to kind of cope with it better than other people may be able to cope with it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you. I hope you both get the call because we've said it yeah, on, on previous episodes it. is that vets make a difference. Like truly, especially come play. hundred percent. You need it. And, and I'm leave complaining of why the game looked the way that there's so many blowouts <laughs> yeah. and, you know, stupidity and these mistakes. It's like, yeah, you need vets in these groups and in these teams. So, yeah, man. Appreciate you, Dan. I appreciate you guys having yeah, me. Yeah, man. Appreciate dope. you, GG. J Dub, man. Good luck, man. Yep. I can't wait to see you back on the floor. I know you're going to get there, brother. If not, keep doing the podcast stuff, keep it with the kids. But I know you're going to get back out there. I can't wait to see you back on the floor, bro. Appreciate, appreciate, appreciate you having me on the podcast. And I wish you all the best, yeah. man. So, love, much love always. And I'm sure I'll see you see y'all soon. Good luck to your boys, too, Kentucky. All right. Hopefully Thank you, too. Big thing. Good luck to your boys, too. Thank all right. You. Uh, check out Inside the Green Room, hosted by Danny Green. Uh, we'll be right back on Point Game, presented by DraftKings. Welcome back to Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano, presented by DraftKings. Now, we're going to play our favorite segment of every show, Bucket or Brick. And as a reminder, Bucket or Brick is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings Sportsbook is your home for all things NBA action, from player props to same-game parlays. Check out everything DraftKings Sportsbook has to offer to make your NBA experience even sweeter. The crown is yours. And I think, John, you remember how to play this, but for anyone listening for the first time, bucket or brick, I'm going to say a statement, and if you agree, you're going to say bucket, and if you disagree, you're going to say brick. So you ready, John? For sure. All right, bucket or brick. Okay, first one, Kentucky is currently plus 700 to make the Final Four. So if you bet $100, you could win 700 bucks if they end up winning the title. So hopefully that happens. So, John, bucket or brick, Kentucky will make the Final Four. Bucket. I got them winning the Final Four. I got them winning the championship. I got them going all the way. Um, I know Cal going to make some adjustments for them, I mean, and let them do what they do. If they lock in defensively, offensively, and scoring and making shots, they got all the tools for that. If they just can lock in on the defensive end for six games, they'll be holding up another national championship. So I have my school going all the Do way. Do you like uh, what, what Danny was saying? Like you almost got to lose one before so you can like really prep for that. Yeah, season. I felt I, – we wanted to win the SEC championship so bad, but it's funny because the first game – when we play Alabama, we got we was down like twenty early on, and before the tournament started, Kyle was like, "Man, I don't really care about this tournament. I'm ready. I'm focused for the next one." You know what I mean? So, you know, what I mean? we kind of we kind of went in with a mindset like we was like, "Then we was like, man, hell no, we trying to win," and we went up into the tournament. Not saying like he wanted us to lose on purpose. Right. You know what I mean? I think, you know, like everybody wants to win SEC championship, regular season. Championship. Everybody, you want to win every game you can. You know what I mean? And it was in Nashville, so you know a lot of Kentucky fans came. But I think like when we won that game, like we would have lost Mississippi State in championship. I think they would have gave us another type of hunger. But, you know what I mean, we left out on a high horse. And not saying that's the reason why we lost. I mean, West Virginia was a better team that day and beat us. But we still came out with that mindset. We was dominating yeah. every game we played. Like, we dominated everybody. We just fell short to a team that was better than us that day. They made shots that we didn't make, and they were better than us. But we felt like – I mean, to Danny, he might have that experience because he's been there before. That was our first year and my only year. I just wanted to win the whole thing. So. Yeah. All right. 
Um, moving in, moving on, staying in college. Okay, so a few teams didn't make the NCAA tourney, um, and they've opted out of the NIT, like St. John's, Syracuse, Oklahoma, and Pittsburgh. So bucket or brick, opting out of the NIT is a good call. Hmm. Told you we're going to throw in some hard work. I say brick. For me, I would say brick because I feel like you still – is representing your school, you still just want to go out there and compete. Right. You know what I mean? Like, even though you fall short of, like, let's say if you're one of the teams that falls short of making the top six teams, you know what I mean? Now you got to be 7, 8, 9, 10 to play in the playing tournament. So you basically don't want to play in the playing tournament. But I guess it's a little different because if you make it through the playing tournament, you get a chance to still win an NBA championship. You know what I mean? But I think just competing, like some of those guys might want to compete. They might still want to play at a high level. You know what I mean? I know they're not probably used to being in the NIT, but it's still – a way where you can still play and compete at a high level. And some of those guys might be seniors. Like, what if those seniors don't get any right. say-so and their last game could have ended how it ended? Yeah. All right. So the, the, that's a brick. So you got to play. I mean, like a lot of these guys, they also want to be showcasing their game still. You know, might be getting ready yeah. for – Yeah, and like you said, some of those guys still can showcase their talent and exactly. still – scouts might still go watch them and see and see how they're doing. Yeah. Okay. All right, moving on to the women's game. Caitlin Clark and Iowa, they got that number one seed in the women's tournament. So – Bucket or brick, Iowa will win the NCAA women's tournament this season. <laughs> a lot of good teams and a lot of good players. I'll say both. I won't say brick, though, because I never know. You never know. You know what I mean? Caitlin Clark is super, super special. She's a, a dope talent. Uh, you still got Don Staley in South Carolina. You know what I mean? You know, you got UConn that's coming up. You still have LSU. Uh, USC is playing well. It's a lot of great teams that's out there. But uh, she's one of those players that she can go on the run like Kimba Walker and, and Shabazz Napier yeah. and them did that one year and go win it all. So I can't really say no. Uh, depends on who they would match up against, but I think she's going to put on a heck of a tournament run. And uh, she might get close to doing what she did last year or not even better. Yeah, okay, you can't say no, but do you have a team maybe that you think, if you were to call it right now, who would win the women's tourney? Or who your favorite? If I had a call, I'm saying South Carolina yeah. for me. Like I mean, just being so dominant uh, two years in a row, undefeated in the regular season. You know, I just think they have a complete team, even though they got a young team. They got a lot yeah. of people that came in that's young. Uh, but I think just the way Don Staley had them playing, the way they believe in themselves. Uh, at the end of the day, when a team like that, I think the only, team, only people that can beat them is themselves. Yeah. Okay. Final bucket or brick, uh, your buddy Dame Lillard, he had a big game uh, against the Suns. So bucket or brick, Dame is the most clutch player in the NBA right now. Just this season or just all? I would all, say, like, like right, 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 right now, this season or, yeah, like, currently most clutch. Uh, this season. Uh, I don't know if he's had to do it a bunch this season. I know he had a, a couple big Yeah, buckets, that's what yeah. I would say. I would say Brick because he hasn't had to do it as much as he did in right. Portland. For me, I think the most clutch guy would, I would say right now would probably be Shea. I mean, because they've been in so many close games. But if you want to say since he's been in the league, I'm damn sure saying Damian Lillard. <laughs> so many clutch shots and big moments. And uh, he lives for those moments. But, you know what I mean, that's what Dame Dollar do. Yeah, definitely one of the top three. Um, all right, John, that's been another episode of Point Game. How you feeling? I feel great, man. I, like I said, I'm excited about uh, where Point Game is going. Um, it's great to get up here every week with you, just talk basketball, just talk anything that's going on in the world and life, just picking people's brains and getting different hosts up here and uh, – Giving the people what they want to hear. So, you know what I mean? I went on the OG show. I shout out the Point Game Pod, you know what yeah. I mean, to get us some more some people to pay attention to what we got going. Um, but I think a lot of people are enjoying the yeah. show. They're enjoying what we have going. And I think we're just going to continue to get better and better. Yeah, like John said, more guests on the way. Keep supporting, uh, you know, the show. Keep following us on socials. Clips are, are coming out. This has been Point Game presented by DraftKings. Also remember, please rate, review, and subscribe. And in the podcast reviews, you can drop questions for John. Uh, he, he's going to answer those on upcoming episodes. So this has been Point Game. I'm CJ Toledano. This is John Wall. Peace. Peace.